eight terabyte SSDs are here. These new drives are based on something called QLC Flash, which promises to be cheap and offer huge capacity, but comes with some serious drawbacks. So what is the good and bad of QLC Flash, and are these new drives going to be enough to finally make hard disks go extinct? Welcome to Upscaled, our explainer show where we dig into the tech that helps you store your thousands of terrible selfies. In our last episode, we took a look at gallium nitride, a wonder material that might revolutionize electronics, maybe. And a number of you in the comments said you would be interested in an episode on battery tech or transistor design. Now we are getting working on those, but in the meantime, I wanted to talk about something related to transistor design, flash memory. Flash is a type of solid state storage, which means it holds data with no moving parts. Flash drives or SSDs have probably done more to revolutionize our actual user experience of interacting with a computer than anything else in the past 15 years. I still remember a past era where you could make and eat a sandwich in the time it would take to open Photoshop. For most of us, SSDs have completely replaced traditional hard drives, and they have reduced the time a computer needs to turn on or open a program from minutes down to seconds. The big advantages of flash drives are fast read and write speeds and low latency, which is the time required to actually go and find data before reading or writing it. But if raw storage is what you need, then SSDs still lag behind traditional hard drives when it comes to price and capacity. This all might be changing with QLC Flash. Now, QLC actually debuted all the way back in 2009, but we're only really starting to see it in SSDs in the past few years. The first consumer 8 terabyte SSDs have just hit the shelves, and we are expecting more in the next few months, and they are all based on QLC. But even though QLC enables these huge capacities, its performance is not always great, and it makes us wonder, are QLC drives really worth it? But first, some basics. All digital storage holds information in a way that it can be read as either a one or a zero. In traditional hard drives, this took the form of tiny magnetic grains on a spinning disk. A head would move over the grains and it would read the direction of the magnetic field. Say, if magnetic north is pointing up, it's a one. If it's pointing down, it's a zero. That kind of thing. In a flash drive, it's a little different. Now, there are actually a bunch of different kinds of flash memory, but the stuff used in pretty much all thumb drives and SSDs is called NAND, or NAND. And this is not an acronym. It stands for not and a type of logic gate. If you watched our gallium nitride episode, you'll remember that logic gates are just arrays of transistors, which themselves are just tiny electronic switches. And that's all NAND flash is, an array of specialized transistors called cells. So how do you store data in a switch? Well, in a traditional transistor, if you remember, if you apply some voltage to a special bit in the middle called a gate, that opens the switch and lets electricity flow through it. In its default state, that's exactly how NAND flash works. Apply a little voltage to the gate and electricity will flow through and the drive will read that transistor as a one. But flash adds a second so-called floating gate. This is usually a little bit of some material like crystalline silicon that is entirely wrapped in an insulator. Because it's insulated, electrons shouldn't be able to flow into the floating gate, but apply a high enough voltage and some of them will actually jump through the insulator and into the silicon. They do this via a type of quantum tunneling called Fowler-Nordheim tunneling. And I can't even begin to fully understand or explain this, but the basic idea seems to be that in quantum mechanics, electrons aren't really particles, they are waves of probability. And with enough energy, there becomes the probability that the electron will actually jump through a material that would otherwise be a barrier. In this case, the insulator around the floating gate. As electrons build up in the floating gate, they actually interfere with the ability of the main gate to open or close that transistor. The same voltage from before won't be enough to open the switch anymore, so current won't flow and the drive will read that as a zero. Newer SSDs use a slightly modified design called a charge trap, which uses silicon nitride, actually another insulator, to hold the electrons instead of the crystalline silicon. This is kind of like a tiny, tiny capacitor, but either way, the basic idea is the same. Electrons get stuck in the transistor and that makes it harder to turn on. This is how a single level cell or SLC flash drive works. Whether or not there are electrons trapped in the transistor determines whether or not it gets read as a one or a zero. Now, SLC drives have a huge advantage over traditional hard drives when it comes to speed, but they are expensive. It takes a lot of transistors to store trillions of bits of data, like literally trillions of them. And even today, an SLC drive like Samsung's Z drive can cost about $2 a gigabyte. Though, to be fair, some lower end SLC drives are more like a buck 15 a gigabyte, but that's still pretty expensive. 
The solution here is to try to find a way to store more bits of data per cell. What if instead of just programmed and erased, you could have partially programmed and partially erased. The actual value getting read by a drive like this is called the threshold voltage, and it is the lowest level of voltage applied to that gate that will open up the transistor and let current flow. With a drive with four possible states like this, you could actually store two bits of data, two pairs of zeros or ones. This is the basis of the increasingly confusingly named multi-level cell, or MLC flash. There's also triple level and quad level, which can store three and four bits respectively. Now, the advantage here should be pretty clear. MLC can store twice the data per transistor that SLC can, and QLC doubles that number again. The flash that is in your computer and phones at this moment is almost certainly TLC, the triple level, which stores three bits per cell. This boost in capacity per cell has been the biggest driver in making flash more widespread and more economical. SLC drives are pretty much only limited to high-end data centers now, and even MLC is pretty rare in consumer devices. A high-end TLC drive is still pretty fast, but only costs between usually about 13 to 18 cents per gigabyte, which is way cheaper than SLC. But there are some drawbacks. You can read from a flash cell just about as many times as you want, but every time you write to it, you actually degrade that insulator around the floating gate or charge trap just a little bit. As the electrons tunnel through that insulator, they can actually break bonds or knock atoms loose. As that insulator breaks down, it gets harder to precisely control the voltage levels and harder to measure them. SLC flash cells can probably be erased and rewritten more than 100,000 times before they start to break down, but current QLC cells can only take about a thousand so-called program erase cycles before that insulator breaks down so much the cells become unreadable. Higher level drives are also just a bit slower. Think about it, a TLC drive needs to check eight different different threshold voltages to get a precise value, and in QLC that's 16 different threshold voltages. As the number of possible values increases, the differences between them get harder to discern, and partly because of this, the read latency for an SSD has just about doubled with each additional bit of data. Reading the different voltage levels is hard enough that starting with MLC drives, SSDs have actually had to incorporate some pretty sophisticated error checking codes to help verify the data, and a cell may actually have to be read more than once to get an accurate result. Writing data is way slower too. SLC is a pretty big margin of error, and it could write data to a cell with just one big voltage pulse. Instead of that, higher level flash has to use cycles of a short pulse and then verification to precisely dial in the required threshold voltage. So with all of that, how do QLC drives actually perform? For reading data, the reality is that even with all these drawbacks, a QLC drive is still generally fast enough to saturate the 500 megabytes or so of a serial ATA connection. Over a much faster PCI Express 3.0 connection, the QLC drives we've seen do tend to fall a bit behind their TLC cousins, but are still plenty fast at over a gigabyte per second. The real problem is with writing data. Currently, QLC drives can only write between about 80 and 160 megabytes per second, which is even slower than some mechanical hard drives. Most QLC drives work around this with caches. To speed up file transfers, the drive will actually just treat some of its cells as if they were SLC, only reading or writing a single bit of data to them. And this can massively speed up file transfers. For example, Intel 665P QLC drive can write at actually about 2,000 megabytes per second, assuming it's got available cache. As the cache starts to fill up, or in idle times, the drive will then repackage some of that data as QLC, almost like compression or zipping a file. Some of these pseudo SLC caches might be static, a defined size, but more often than not, they're dynamic, shrinking or expanding based on the amount of free space on the drive. This caching scheme actually usually does a pretty good job hiding QLC's flaws, but it's not perfect. If you transfer massive files or do big sustained workloads, you could exhaust that cache and you'll see a performance drop. With an empty drive, these caches can be huge, up to 25% of the drive's capacity. But as you fill up that drive with data, the dynamic cache will shrink, reducing performance over time. In that Intel 2TB 665P drive, as the drive passes 50% capacity, the cache shrinks rapidly, from 280 gigabytes down to a mere 24 gigabytes at 75% full. At that point, any file transfers or operations that exceed that 24 gigabyte capacity in a short amount of time will see their write performance drop by 95%. 
this isn't new. TLC drives actually do the exact same thing, but the write performance of a TLC drive is about 10 times better than QLC. So if you run out of cash, the difference just isn't nearly as stark. So with poor endurance, reduced lifespans, and bad write speeds, should you entirely avoid QLC drives? Well, not necessarily. For certain applications like media streaming or databases or backups or even a Steam game library, they're really not a bad choice. The pseudo SLC cache tends to work pretty well, and you might never exhaust it in normal usage, especially if you keep your drive less than about 65% full. And unless you are writing tons of data, the reduced endurance shouldn't really be a problem either. Most QLC drives are still rated for between about 100 terabytes and 300 terabytes of data written per one terabyte of drive capacity, which means a four terabyte QLC drive will still probably keep you going through writing about 80 days worth of 4K footage. The real problem right now is that QLC drives just aren't that much cheaper than TLC. Samsung's QLC-based 970 QVO costs about $250 right now for two terabytes. The problem is that you can get a Samsung 970 Evo, a TLC-based drive, for just about $350. More expensive, but not wildly so. By the way, Samsung calls the Evo 3-bit MLC, but everyone else would call that TLC. The issue here is that there are high-performance TLC drives, like the MX500, for as little as $230, and even slightly slower ones for as little as $195. So why spend $50 more for slower memory? And while QLC is here, it's not really taking over. Despite the fact that SLC and MLC have pretty much vanished from consumer drives, companies aren't talking about moving away from TLC in the same way. The SSD market is just splitting the same way the hard drive market did back in the day, with high-performance 10,000 RPM drives for servers and low-cost 5,400 RPM drives for data backups and storage. In the future, you might get a fast TLC drive for your operating system and programs, and a slightly slower but bigger QLC or even PLC drive, that is 5 bits and 32 threshold voltage states, for your backup and storage. Future SSDs might even combine multiple types of storage on one drive. What about an 8 terabyte QLC drive with a dedicated 1 terabyte TLC or MLC cache that would make sure you got full performance even as the drive filled up? SSD capacity is improving in other ways ways too. 3D NAND, which Samsung insists on calling VNAND because of course they do, is already the standard in high capacity drives, and it boosts storage by stacking the flash cells vertically. Current SSDs can have memory chips with as many as 96 layers of flash, and 144 layer flash is expected soon. And as companies refine their QLC designs, that should help prices come down and lead to even bigger drives and maybe even slightly improved performance. But still, I wouldn't entirely write off hard disks. It's unclear if the sacrifices needed in performance to make higher capacity drives are going to continue to be worth it. Or put another way, if PLC is even slower than QLC, which it looks like it will be, then how cheap would it have to be to make it worth it to you? After all, while we're still waiting for the prices of 8 terabyte QLC drives to go down, Western Digital did just release an 18 terabyte hard drive for $600. Early SSD tech has just never really made sense for the price conscious. Back in 2010, I spent $250 for a mere 80 gigabytes of MLC flash, and again spent $350 for 400 gigs in 2015. Today that would get you 2 terabytes of flash storage, and sure, it would be TLC flash and maybe a tiny bit slower, but would the average user ever really notice? And if you are the kind of person who needs to store, say, 18 terabytes of data, or maybe have cold storage where you can keep data disconnected connected from power, hard drives are going to make a lot of sense for a long time. But if you're just looking for a few more gigs to store some movies or games, well, QLC has a lot going for it, especially as the cost per gigabyte is expected to come down. And if the price per gigabyte gets cheap enough, it'll be easier to get big enough drives that have enough cash that they'll still perform great. But maybe avoid QLC drives under a terabyte. I just don't see that ever working out very well. Be sure to like and subscribe. We have a bunch more episodes coming up, including Risk 5. And let us know if there's anything else you want us to dig into. We'll catch you next time.